Open up your phones, open up your tablets, however you want to get there, get to Daniel 10. We're going to talk about that this morning. As you're turning there, the text this morning is taken from Ephesians and Paul writing to the church there, he said this, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but again, enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This is our battle, church. This is your battle. It's not just the church's battle, but it's your battle personally, and this is what we're involved in. And the quicker we get that message, the more victorious the songs that we sang this morning will be more applicable in our lives. Would you agree with that? Sure we would. Cosmic spiritual forces always seek to influence the lives of believers, influence um, cities, influence countries, influence counties. We are battling this. Paul specifically says this to us. And they affect the everyday affairs of human life every single day. The enemy is relentless. He doesn't give up. Wake up. We need to wake up to that fact. Sometimes we, we go through life and we're kind of tiptoeing through the beautiful fields and the tulips and, and it's wonderful. And we don't even acknowledge that there's a spiritual realm and there's a war that's going on for your very existence, for your very soul. The enemy would love nothing more than to take you out. As we've mentioned in our previous lessons over the last several weeks, we've spoken about you now in the latter part of Daniel as we began in chapter 7. We saw the vision of the four beasts. We saw the ram and the goat. Last week we touched on the 70 weeks. This week we want to talk about the fourth and the last vision that Daniel has and it concerns from chapter 10 right through the end. And it has this involvement of where we find ourselves today in our lives. The vision of the end as we begin in Daniel chapter 10. This is what he sees concerning our lives, but not only our lives, but what happened and what was going to happen to Israel. In this chapter, we'll see the heavenly, there's the heavenly messenger that comes from God, sent by God to impart information to Daniel. He wanted to come tell Daniel what was going to happen. The account of his coming is really significant to us because it involves a conflict in the heavenlies. This emissary that God sends, he's on his way to talk to Daniel and something happens in the heavenlies. We'll see the important facts as, as relative to angels and demons and, their, and, and our perspective and, and, and what's going on in the world today. We'll see the work of God. In the chapter, we'll see God showing Daniel many things and his purpose and his plan in history regarding the nation of Israel and the everlasting kingdom to come. In chapter 10, we will find the beginning of the final vision of Daniel. It's, it's interesting how this concerns you and I even today. We will notice that verse 1 speaks of Daniel in the third person, suggesting that the statement that opens this chapter may have been an official identification or title for the next three chapters. He's, uh, you ever see that Seinfeld show where George speaks in the third person? Yeah? Well, that's, it's almost like that. George, yeah, what, yeah, I don't know if you remember that show, but it was really funny. He's always speaking about himself in the third person. But then it also uses the Babylonian name that we see that, 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 that King Nebuchadnezzar gave to him was Belshazzar as a label of, for an official document. So this is official that we're going to read here. Then from verse 2 on throughout the rest of the chapters, we will again see Daniel speaking in the first person where he's relating to what actually happened. In Daniel chapter 9, the chapter begins with Daniel concerned about the end of, uh, of the captivity. It's called the vision of the time of the end. And it began there as we see the, what's going to happen towards the end of time. What is the expression, the time of the end? What does that actually mean to you and I? Are you and I living in the time of the end? I don't know. Maybe we are, maybe we aren't. But we'll see. What does the scripture say? As we look to address this and other questions, as we see this raised up in the scriptures, we hope that we're going to find out how this is relevant to us. How Daniel prophecy and how his vision pertains to you and I this morning. He saw an awesome vision of heaven. He saw this heavenly envoy come to him. He saw this individual in the first three verses, we present this, this general setting for this messenger's appearance. It takes place, the scripture says, in the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, on the 24th day of the month. Now, I'm not sure what that significance is, but I'm not going to get into that because there's more that I want to talk about. 
Daniel has been mourning. He's been fasting for three weeks, praying and fasting and mourning for Israel. Three weeks. You know, there's some people that wanted to get away, and we mentioned this a little bit on, on our Wednesday um, talk. But we need to get away sometimes because the stuff of the world just crowds into our lives and we need to just separate ourselves. Jesus did that often. He, separated, he, he got away from the disciples and he went to a place just to pray for himself. And he was there on his own. And we need to sometimes do that is just, just separate ourselves just for a moment or two. And some people like to do that. They would like to go down to the beach or to the mountains or to a river or to the forest or wherever they find solace just to get away, to hear from God. Some would like to go into, the, into, the, into deserts. There we find a different perspective on life because then we get away from what's really crowding in into our lives. We find ourselves being able to focus. And that's exactly what Daniel did. He finds himself walking along the edge of the Tigris River, a big river in Mesopotamia. For walking along, and this is a real, really important because it was part of Babylon. It was, it was right there. His prayers were powerful because right there, and we know his prayers were powerful because God actually sent a messenger to him to answer his prayers. So it's not like Daniel was praying for three weeks ineffectively. No, he was praying effectively. God heard him the moment he prayed. And sometimes, you know, we, we, we pray, but we don't hear God, right? Anyone say that? Yeah. Well, in Daniel's case, he was fasting and praying for three weeks, and he didn't hear from God. He said, you know, what, what, what's up with that? And then we find how God reveals what happened. So he sends one of his special emissaries to Daniel. John describes this in the first verse of Revelation. He had the same vision of, of, of this, this divine being. The vision came to Daniel in Cyrus's third year. And Daniel by now was about 84 to about 85 years of age. So those of us in the 70s or 50s or 60s, you know, God will still talk to you when you're 85. Isn't that amazing? God doesn't give up on us. He's always ministering to us. And if he's not ministering to you right now, right now, wait and trust him to talk to you. He lived a long, long enough and he lived long enough to see Jeremiah's prophecy being fulfilled. With the first group of Jewish exiles returning to the promised land and, 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 the re and the rebuilding of the walls and the rebuilding of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. From his viewpoint, 70 years had seemed to be over now. All the Jewish exiles should have been so, so joyous at, at, and, and rejoicing and saying, listen, I'm, we're going back to Jerusalem. We're going back to Judah. Hallelujah. And they were, they were celebrating. Yeah, that didn't happen. We only see a few of the exiles returning back to Jerusalem. Daniel therefore turns to the Lord in prayer. He, he didn't understand. You know, sometimes God leads us and we think, man, everyone's going to get on board. Everyone's going to be excited about what God's doing. And we look at the church, we look at Christians, and it's just this handful that are excited about the Lord. And we think, well, what, what is with that? Why don't we all get on board and get excited about Jesus? It's the same as why didn't all the Jewish folks that were in exile get excited to go back to Jerusalem? Daniel is so deeply moved and so he comes humbly before the Lord and he fasts and he prays on the behalf of his people. Oh, if the church, if you and I would just fast and sometimes pray for America instead of getting upset and being, you know, how about doing what Daniel did? Interceding. The vision that God had shown Daniel was true because he realized that it would be filled many years from now. Daniel understood that his people would suffer greatly in the years ahead, but the Lord would watch over them and ultimately establish his promised kingdom with them. This was also true of us today. We need to trust God that God's plan and purpose will ultimately be fulfilled in, in either our lifetime or in the lifetime of our children or their children. But God's word is true. It will be fulfilled. He opens up the doors before us. And if we fail to walk through them, many of us are like those Hebrew people that just didn't want to go into the land that God had given to them. Sometimes God opens a door for us and he says, follow me through here. And we look through the door and we see all sorts of scary stuff. And we say, yeah, I don't think so. Right? But Jesus is there. 
Now you can see Jesus in the midst of the turmoil. That's what Daniel saw. He saw the Lord doing this and he saw the future of Israel and yet he still wanted to follow. You know, so we mustn't be scared of what God, where God's leading us. Trust him. Remember that this isn't our final destiny. They didn't follow the opportunity that the Lord had given them to go into a greater place, into the promised land. Go back to the promised land, to what God had originally planned for them. And sometimes we've drifted away from the, God, from the Lord and, and, and we don't want to go back there because we're really not committed to Him. Yeah, we can sing the songs, we can come to church, but does it mean that we are really committed? So who is this individual, this heavenly envoy? Suddenly out of the blue, without any announcement, Daniel sees this awesome sight. Daniel was on the shore of the Tigris River when he had this vision. And in his vision, he sees a man dressed in linen. It was a common outfit for an angel in, in Bible times. White linen represented that the individual was ritually pure. That it was a priestly garment that they wore. Look what it says in Daniel chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. I looked up and I saw a man dressed in linen, clothed with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body looked like a precious, a precious gem. His face flashed like, like lightning and his eyes flamed like torches. His arms and feet shone like, burning, like, like polished bronze and his voice roared like the vast multitude of people. But only Daniel saw the vision. Remember, so Daniel goes down to the room. He's got a couple of his friends and mates with him. And they're kind of walking along. Daniel sees the vision. But his friends didn't see the vision, the scripture says. They didn't see the messenger. They didn't see this angelic being appear to Daniel. But they sensed something was going on in the atmosphere. They sensed something that, that terrified them so deeply that they turned on their heels and fled and hid themselves, the scripture says. You ever been in a situation, you walk into a place and there's like a vibe? Yeah? We, so I, I've been there, like we, 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 Sharon and I went to a church in England, um, in, in London, and I walked in, I, 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 there was just a vibe there. Remember that, Sharon? The hair on the back of my head kind of stood up. It was like bizarre. I thought, there's, there's a presence here. And it wasn't a pleasant presence. Sharon, we were in Washington, we went to a particular place, and Sharon says, there's a vibe here that's not godly. And that's what we see over here. These friends of Daniel sensed a presence and they became terrified that they took, they, they, they literally ran and hid themselves. Maybe there were some bushes along or shrubs or reeds along the side of the river. I don't know. But they, they hid themselves because they sensed something. In the, in, 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 they sensed this vibe or this in, in the atmosphere. Look at the impact that it had on Daniel. As we look in verses 8 and 9, when Daniel saw the vision, his strength and vigor turned to frailty. I mean, he literally collapsed within himself when he saw this vision. When he heard the sound of the man's words, Daniel fell into a deep sleep with his face to the ground. Look at the conversation that he had with his heavenly envoy. The angel didn't give up on Daniel when he saw him fall asleep. I, th I think, you know, this, the way the writer and the way Daniel wrote this, I, th I think he fainted with his face to the ground at this vision. I don't know about you, but if I were to see an archangel described like Daniel did, I don't know how I'd behave. But I would probably behave in a similar fashion. He got, he got to the point where he was, he was the, the angel reached out to him and, and, he, and he reached and, and lifted him up to the point where he could understand where he was clear-minded again. What a beautiful picture that God doesn't give up on us. That angel didn't give up on Daniel when he fainted or it looked like he was asleep. He didn't leave him there. He reached out to him. He touched him. You know, sometimes when we find ourselves asleep and we're not serving God, God hasn't left us. He hasn't given up on us. He comes to you and he reaches out to you. And he touches you. He says, let me talk to you, my friend. Let me talk to you, my child. I want to tell you some stuff. What were the, uh, uh, the envoy's initial words to him? And he says, And the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up, for I have been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood, stood up, still trembling. God calls you, and the wonderful thing that we hear, we see God's words here to Daniel, you are very precious to God. 
You are a man in another translation. Greatly beloved. Oh man. But the wonderful news is, and the great news for you and I today, is that each one of us are loved by God in the same way that God loves Daniel. You are very precious to him as well. Think about that. That Jesus Christ died for you. He gave his life. That's how much he loves you. So that you and I don't have to die. You are greatly loved. You are precious to God. So precious and so valuable that Jesus gave his life for you. Daniel comes to realize how, how, how the Lord loved him. And then the angelic messenger confronts Daniel and explains the reason for the delay, why his prayers weren't answered immediately, because Daniel had such a connection to God. When he prayed, God answered. I mean, when he asked God, remember when he, for the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams and so on, immediately he got the answer. Now suddenly it took, it's, it's three weeks. Where are you, God? Where, why haven't you answered? Daniel wasn't accustomed to having his prayers unanswered. He was used to having them answered immediately. So he prayed and fasted for three weeks, and suddenly this, this shining individual appears before him. The Bible says it was a fast. It, 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 it was probably a fast of like bread and water because the text shows us that he had no choice food or wine, or nor did he use any lotions. Psalm 47 says it would be inappropriate to use lotions in, 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 in a fast. And as the angel talked, he may have been thinking to himself, gosh, where have you been all this time? Don't you see that I've been praying now for the last three weeks? You know, I'm pretty hungry by now. You know, I'm, yeah, you know, that choice food that I, that I, I didn't have it anymore. And so maybe he was a little frustrated. Maybe he was, yeah, you know, where have you been all this time? Why, has, why hasn't God answered? Look what he says. And then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. For since the day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia had blocked the way. What? Something was going on that Daniel wasn't aware of. He wasn't aware that this battle was going on with the spirit prince of Persia. Then Michael, he says, one of the archangels came to help me. And I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Who was this messenger? Some believe that this messenger or what Daniel saw being this messenger was a theophany or of the pre-incarnate Christ. Maybe, maybe that's, yeah, but that's not really hard because it doesn't fit. I don't believe that because Jesus has authority over the enemy and he would never be detained by a demon or, or, a, or, 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 a, or an arch demon or as it were. Jesus has authority, he just says it, and then they flee from him. So it couldn't have been the Lord himself. I don't believe that Jesus had ever been detained by a, by a satanic or demonic force. So God chose one of his top angels to bring the messenger to Daniel. God heard Daniel from the very first moment that he started to pray. It wasn't that God was deaf or didn't tune in or he was in a different bandwidth. No, God heard him immediately. I love that. How the angel says that when you pray, God hears. The moment Daniel prayed, God heard. The moment you and I, church, pray, God hears us. Can, yeah, yeah, I like that. Amen. That was like a, uh, a wimpy kind of amen. 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 God hears us. Amen. So when we pray, God hears us. In Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 through 15, Daniel said, and then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come to answer your prayer. But for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. I can see Daniel scratching his head. Well, what does that mean? Then Michael, he says, one of the archangels came to help me and I left him there with the spirit prince of Persia. And now I'm here to explain what will happen to your people in the future. For this vision concerns a time yet to come. So what the angel was going to tell him was concerning the coming, the coming time. It hadn't happened. But Daniel, I want to tell you what's about to happen. It's coming. Daniel's conversation with the, with the angel reveals to us the important fact 
that there is an invisible war going on and that God has the future already planned for us. Isn't that, doesn't that give you consolation? Doesn't it give you strength? And God knows what tomorrow will hold. We don't. Daniel didn't know. But God knew. And as Daniel was praying, God heard him, dispatched an angel to give him the answer. And somehow in between heaven and earth, the angel was, was accosted by this evil, fallen spirit. And the battle took place in the heavenlies. So much so that Michael the archangel comes to help him. That wasn't just a little skirmish or disagreement or an argument. There was, a, there was a fight that was going on, a vicious fight between the forces of evil of this prince of Persia and, well, I think Gabriel. He says, I've been standing beside Michael to support and strengthen him since the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. Why was there a spiritual battle going on? Because Darius, Cyrus, wanted to send the children of Israel back to their home. This demon didn't want that. This angelic power, fallen angelic power or demonic power, this prince or this, this ruler of the territory of Persia didn't want that to happen. Remember, he hates Israel, the enemy. But God has a plan for Israel. And this demonic power wanted to thwart that, what was going on. I think so many well-meaning, quote-unquote, Christians, and maybe even people, may scoff at the idea of demonic forces of good and evil. Ah, that's just fairy tales. That's just primitive belief. It's just a caricature of, of what people think the enemy might be like. And yet the Bible is so true. It says there is a spiritual battle going on for your life. There's a spiritual battle going on for the heart of America. There's a spiritual battle going on for the heart of the church. Doesn't change whether you believe that or not. Doesn't change the fact that it is. Satan does have his army of fallen angels and they are well organized. Don't think that this thing doesn't exist. The biblical theology then is where that Lucifer, the, this, this beautiful angel, rebelled against God, was judged, and a third of the angels fell away with him. They rebelled against God, and they were thrown to the earth. And they oppose anything of Christ. They oppose anything of God. They oppose us when you're a follower of God. In fact, they oppose humanity, period, because we are created in the image of God, and he cannot stand that fact. And so if he'll try his utmost to destroy humanity, because God loves humanity and gave his life for us. That's why there's such a battle going on. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And then there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Michael, one of the archangels, is described as one of the chief princes. And we find that he is the prince. He's the great prince who stands over your people. Michael is the archangel of Israel. And he stands in protection of Israel. Look what he says. Meanwhile, I will tell you what was written in the book of truth. No one helps me against these spirit princes except Michael, your spirit prince. Who is he talking to? To Daniel. And who is Daniel praying for? For his people, for Israel, for Judah. Jude calls Michael the archangel who contended with the devil over the body of Moses. Michael appears to be, have served as the guardian angel at this time for the nation of Israel. And I don't think he has stopped. But there's a, we, God wants to do something in the lives of people. And now the archangel had come to, to give Daniel understanding of what would happen to Israel in the latter times, in many days yet still to come. In the days of, of Antiochus Epiphanes and also in the future coming of Antichrist. He was giving them the heads up and we know what happened when he set up this image. 
And from what follows, the expression latter days appears to also refer to the, the time leading up to the coming of Messiah in the Messianic time. As we read in Joel chapter 2 and 3, do yourselves a favor, go back and read the book of Joel. It's just four chapters. But it speaks of the coming of Messiah. It speaks about the Messianic age. In fact, Peter in Acts chapter 2 quotes from Joel. Joel chapter 2, that it says about in the latter days, all this will happen. And he says, in Matthew 24 verse 41, Jesus says, And the king will turn to those on his left and say, Away, from me, away with you, you cursed ones, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. There will come a time where this judgment will happen, where the prince of Persia is going to be destroyed, where the prince of Greece will be destroyed, where Antichrist will be thrown into the pit of hell. It is clear that the prince of Persia isn't a human being because no person could resist the messenger of God. Satan's world isn't run, is run by demonic forces. He's the one orchestrating what's going on in the heavenlies. The prince of darkness, Satan himself, has control of the world. Jesus recognized him as the prince of this world. He referred to him. We have come to terms with the fact that this world is under the control of the enemy. Understand that. When you look at the world's systems and what's happening, there's nothing godly about it. Nothing. Zero. When God's messenger was intercepted in the heavenlies, it was a demon that was assigned to Persia. Who assigned him? Satan himself. Daniel then is strengthened in, in verses 15 through 19. Initially what we see that Daniel was speechless but, and his face was turned to the ground. But the one that looked like a man touched his lips and, and Daniel could now speak, but he was overwhelmed with sorrow and without strength because of his vision. Because he saw what was going to happen in the future. But the angel didn't leave him there sorrowful and, and all upset and bent out of shape. He, he came and ministered to him and he touched him. Daniel is strengthened and encouraged by the words of the envoy. And he experienced the love of God, the peace of God. And it brought courage to his heart. Twice the angel told him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And church, that's what God would tell you and I today as well. Church, don't be afraid. Be my, my child, don't be afraid. When you look at the world, don't fret. Don't be afraid. The envoy then resumes his words with Daniel as we see in verses 20 through um, to chapter 11 verse 1. Gabriel made it clear that the battle wasn't over yet. He had to return and fight the prince of Persia. And he replied, Do you know why I have come? Soon I must return and fight against the prince of Persia and the kingdom of Persia. And after that, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. Remember, we've spoken about these different empires over the, over the last several weeks, about Persia and about Greece, about Rome, and about the future coming kingdom. We, we've spoken about this, about the ram and the goat. And, and we've seen all these visions that Daniel had. And all this is now coming down to the point where he sees, but it's more than just that, about a nation coming. These nations were inspired by Satan himself. They were godless. They never knew the God of Israel. They didn't know the God of the heavens. They were godless. Yeah, and he had to deal with this prince of Greece who was yet to come. Remember Antiochus Epiphanes? Remember what he did in the temple? He sacrificed a pig on the altar. He defiled the temple of God. He tells Daniel what's noted in our scripture. And he says, Meanwhile, I will tell you what is written in the book of truth, that no one helps me against the spirit princes except Michael, your spirit prince. I have been standing beside Michael to support and strengthen him since the very first year of the reign of Darius the Mede. There was something going on, and he, this battle was raging. He says that only Michael helps him against this, this, uh, this, this satanic evil force that was opposing the plans that God had to return Israel. This rule of Persia had shown kindness and mercy to the Jews in allowing them to return back to the homeland, back to Israel, back to Jerusalem. 
But Satan was against that decision. And sometimes you're praying for something, but the enemy doesn't want your prayers to reach God. And so the enemy tries to thwart, and God wants to answer your prayer. And, 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 he, and, he, and he, uh, I believe in angels. We've got, there's, there's so many ministering angels, we're not even aware of it. Not that we worship angels, we worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and his name is Jesus. But these messengers and these envoys, God has for his people. I think there are so many times that, that things have, 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 have turned around in one's life, or maybe you're driving around and just suddenly you, you stop and it's like, and there comes a car, just swerves in front of you. And it, it's like an angel must push that away and, and avoid it in an accident. I believe that we do have, you know, we always tell kids these guardian angels, I do believe they are sent from God. Adding to the point and the support here that, that Michael was sent to strengthen him. People, you and I must come to realize that there is a cosmic war that stands behind human conflict. It rages. When you see a conflict going on, understand there's something behind that. When you have such fighting and bickering within a family, there's something behind that. It's not the person. If Paul says we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principality, there's something behind this. So don't fight with one another. Recognize what's going on. That's where you fight. And now we come to see what's behind Daniel's previous visions of nations rising up. That there is a spiritual war raging behind the scenes. We see that these heavenly powers are fighting against spirit, the, the, uh, uh, the, that there's spiritual powers that are associated with the state, especially Persia and Greece, which are more than just evil nations. And if the veil would be able to just be pulled back a little bit, we'd see the spiritual horrors behind these powers. If we could just pull that veil a little bit back and see what's happening in the spiritual realm, you don't have to be afraid because the blood of Jesus has covered you. But you will recognize where the battle is. And it's a battle for you. It's the battle for the body of Christ. It's the battle against humanity. We also realize that these evil spiritual powers still exist today and will continue to do so until Jesus Christ comes back the second time with his glorious appearing and will destroy the works of the enemy. And death itself will be conquered. And Satan and the Antichrist will be thrown into the lake of fire that was prepared for him. He doesn't want you to know that because he thinks he's ultimately still going to win. We also realize that there is certain judgment coming to those who resist God and oppress God's people. Judgment will come. It is coming. And so those who are inspired by evil, and we see what how people are inspired or maybe even demonically possessed and oppressed, that there's an enemy behind that because sometimes you look at that, how can a person do that to another person? There's evil in the world, and it comes from Satan himself. One of the reasons why God commands his people to pray for those in authority is that God will not, God's will and Satan's plans are in conflict. And so we pray that God's will will be accomplished sooner than later. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, and I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray for all people. Pray this way for kings and all those who are in authority so that we can live peacefully and, qui and, and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior. When last did you pray for Putin? When last did you pray for Zelensky? When last did you pray for Biden that his heart would change? For our Congress. Sometimes we look at those guys and we want to pray down God's fire on them. I know I've got to catch myself. But I pray, God, may your will be done and I pray, oh God, be merciful to us as a people. The destiny 
of more than one nation has been changed because God's people earnestly prayed. I think when the angel came and it took three weeks to bring the answer, there's a destiny that changed in Israel. So in this message, in these introductory things that we're speaking about, about spiritual warfare and stuff that's going on behind the scenes, I want you to understand that this is real. And you can't get away from it. When the angelic forces, they, they, they are sent here to help us. Michael was introduced to us. The great prince that protects your people. There is little no about there's, there's, there's not so much that we know about spiritual warfare, but, I mean, but there, are, there are passages that we're going to look at next week that, 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 that speak to us and clearly reveal to us the depth of spiritual warfare. We're going to look at some stuff that, that God has given to us to be victorious about the things that we sang about this morning. And I want to close with a scripture in, in, in a moment in, from Ephesians again that says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood. Paul said that we are not fighting. We are not fighting with people. Flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. This is our battle. Against mighty powers in the dark age. It doesn't say wimpy powers. It says mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. This is your battle. This is my battle. This is our battle, church. This is our battle together. And next week, we're going to look a little deeper into what this cosmic warfare is all about. We're still going to be in Daniel, but we're going to emphasize and we're going to look at this because I, I believe God wants us all to be equipped and to recognize when this occurs in our lives and that we don't just walk through the world oblivious to the things that are going on in the spiritual world. This week, take those little booklets. Use them to tell someone about Jesus. That they too can experience the peace of God. Because that's what God wants us to have. In the midst of turmoil, in the midst of havoc, to know his peace. I believe that God can give that to you. To each of us. As we draw close to him. And so those that are watching online, join us next week as we go into this a little deeper and that you can be equipped to fight the battle victoriously because he has already won and he's our victor. He's Jehovah Nisi, our banner over us. Amen. God bless you.